Last time we were in early March and we considered the story of Samson from Judges 13 to 16. There's only two more um, s- sermons um, in tonight, uh, this morning and one more sermon whenever we have the opportunity for that that we will spend in Judges. Um, and this morning we're going to look at chapters 17 and 18 which form one section and then next time we will look at chapters 19 to 21 whenever we have opportunity to do that. But as we begin this morning, um, as you're making your way there, I'll tell you the story of Dan Stevenson. Dan Stevenson is a resident of Oakland, California, and he came to local fame in 1999 when he used epoxy and rebar to attach a statue of Buddha into a, a traffic median just outside his house. For a long time, this traffic median had become a a dumping ground. People were just dumping things. And despite his many complaints to the local municipality, nothing seemed to be done about it. And so, although he considers himself to be irreligious, he figured that Buddha is a a nice, sort of neutral, friendly kind of guy. And maybe he will uh, dissuade people from using the traffic median as a dumping ground. Well, about four months after installing the statue... Stevenson looked out his window one morning and he noticed that someone had painted the statue white. And over the next few weeks, that paint job became more colorful and more elaborate. Before long, he noticed that offerings of fresh fruit and vegetables and flowers were left at the base of the statue in the mornings. And then not long after that, someone had constructed a simple wooden structure around the statue in order to protect it from the elements. Stevenson did some research and he learned that evidently Oakland has a sizable Vietnamese Buddhist community and that these Buddhists had decided that this statue should be turned into a shrine. Eventually worshippers discovered the identity of the installer and Stevenson would go out in the mornings and he would find uh, gifts of fruit and vegetables and stuff left on his, on his front door as, as thanks from this Buddhist community. Over time, the statue's housing became far more elaborate to the point where, where now, if you looked at photos on, on the internet, it's actually like a l- little shrine and you can go inside there. Two or three people can actually go inside there and worship at the statue. Worshippers installed other statues alongside the shrine to be there with Buddha and it quickly became a place of daily worship. Well, some of Stevenson's neighbors grew a little bit irritated with the noise of this morning worship. And so they appealed in 2012 for authorities to remove the statue. And authorities were planning to do that, but kickback from the worshippers in particular and the larger community um, resulted in them cancelling those plans. Interestingly, by 2014, crime in the neighborhood had fallen by 82%. Now, Stevenson attributes the decrease in criminal activity directly to this installation of Buddha, The police are not so sure that there's a direct correlation, but nevertheless, no further attempts have been made to remove the statue. And you can go and look on the internet and you can see the the Oakland Buddha sitting there in the the middle of the the road on this traffic median. Now, the account of this Oakland Buddha highlights the fact that human beings are prone to religious expression. There's something intrinsically religious about the human condition which is bound to find expression in one form or another. The question simply is, will this expression of religion, will this expression of worship be one that honors the living God or one that dishonors the living God? Judges chapter 17 and 18 confronts us with this very question. So if you're in Judges chapter 17, let's read uh, chapter 17. It's 13 verses. I won't read chapter 18. Chapter 18 is long, but we'll talk about it as we go through. But just to get the, the flow of the story, Judges chapter 17. Verse 1, there was a man of the hill country of Ephraim whose name was Micah. And he said to his mother, the 1100 pieces of silver that were taken from you about which you uttered a curse and also spoke it in my ears, behold, the silver is with me. I took it. And his mother said, blessed be my son by the Lord. And he restored the 1100 pieces of silver to his mother. And his mother said, I dedicate the silver to the Lord from my hand for my son to make a carved image and a metal image. Now, therefore, I will restore it to you. So when he restored the money to his mother, his mother took 200 pieces of silver and gave it to the silversmith who made it into a carved image and a metal image. And it was in the house of Micah. And the man Micah had a shrine. 
And he made an ephod and household gods and ordained one of his sons who became his priest. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Now there was a young man of Bethlehem in Judah, of the family of Judah, who was a Levite. And he sojourned there. And the man departed from the town of Bethlehem in Judah to sojourn where he could find a place. And as he journeyed, he came to the hill country of Ephraim, to the house of Micah. And Micah said to him, where do you come from? And he said, I am a Levite of Bethlehem in Judah, and I'm going to sojourn where I may find a place. And Micah said to him, stay with me and be to me a father and a priest, and I will give you ten pieces of silver a year and a suit of clothes and your living. And the Levite went in. And the Levite was content to dwell with the man, and the young man became to him like one of his sons. And Micah ordained the Levite, and the young man became his priest and was in the house of Micah. Then Micah said, Now I know the Lord will prosper me, because I have a Levite as priest. Well, the story of Samson that we considered last time we were together in the book of Judges ends the account of the men and the women that God raised up to judge Israel and to deliver Israel. Chapter 17 to 21 focuses emphasis slightly. And rather, fo- rather than focusing on the external threat to Israel from foreign nations, these chapters focus on the internal threat within Israel because of Israel's own idolatry. We saw previously that during Samson's judgeship in particular, complacency is sent in. Samson's frustration was that while he knew that God had delivered him to, ra- to raised him to deliver Israel, the people would not rally to his side. When he was trying to fight against the Philistines, they were saying to him, don't you realize, Samson, that the Philistines are ruling over us? There's nothing we could do. And Samson was forced to fight alone. Well, how do we, how do we understand that? How do we explain that acceptance of defeat, that complacency that had set in? Well, these closing chapters help us to understand that attitude. It's because the people had entirely abandoned allegiance to Yahweh to the God of the Bible, their society was a mess and the spiritual lethargy prevented them from even asking for or expecting deliverance. These chapters, these closing chapters, which really go hand in hand, it's, it's somewhat unfortunate they would, that we'll probably have a big gap between our time considering these, these two closing sections because chapter 17 to 18 shows us the religious chaos that existed in Israel during the time of the Judges. And chapters 19 to 21 show us the social chaos that existed in the time of the judges. Of course, those two are not disconnected because when God's people lose sight of true gospel allegiance, it's usually not too long before social chaos follows. As goes the church, so goes the world. When a people loses its religious moorings, it's just a matter of time before ethical and social chaos follows. Now, just a word, as you read these closing chapters, when you're reading through the book of Judges, don't think that this all follows chronologically. So it's not as if Samson died, and then chapters 17 to 21 happened, and then after that, the story of First Samuel picks up. In fact, when we were talking about the story of Judges, of Samson, I said that Samson and Samuel were probably contemporaries. They were ruling at the same time, or they were ministering at the same time. And these chapters over here, chapter 17 to 21, don't tell us about the time after Samson. They tell us about the time during Samson and probably even some of the earlier judges, probably stretching back as far as to chapter 9, the time of Abimelech. This is what things were like in Israel while these judges were trying to help God's people. It's as if the writer is saying, okay, I've told you about the judges now. And if the judges seem to be unhinged to you, wait till I tell you what the people were like at this particular time. Well, our focus in this study is going to be the religious chaos that the author highlights in chapters 17 and 18. And then next time when we have opportunity, we'll consider the social chaos that gripped Israel at this time. And there's simply three points that I want to talk about today. Three things that I want to uh, talk about as we consider the story as a whole. The first thing I want to talk about is the unfolding chronicle. Just talk about the story. How does the, the author actually tell us the story? And then I want to talk about the author's unspoken critique And then finally, I want to talk about the the author's unmistakable condemnation. And that'll be the the bulk of it. The the major teaching of this text will be found in that last point. But before we get there, we just need to consider the basic story. We read part of it, but we need to talk about what happened after the part of the story that we read. 
Because the writer has a particular way of telling the story. In his book on, on um, judges, a guy by the name of John Herkus writes this. He says, quote, In all my life so far, and that's most of it, I have never heard a single reference from the pulpit or songwriter or study leader or anybody else at all, never one single tiny whispered sound that related to the mica of the book of Judges. And he suggests that there's a reason for this. He says because this story, and certainly the story that follows in chapter 19 to 21 as well, this story is just so crazy and so mixed up that people are just embarrassed about it. I don't know if you've ever felt that way. I don't know if you've ever read these closing chapters of Judges and just thought, sure, this is not, this is not the nicest part. This is not, this is not, the, this is not what you're going to build a holiday Bible club around, these closing chapters of, of Judges. <clears throat> Christians seem to prefer to distance themselves from their text. And if you know that feeling, be encouraged that actually the writer himself is kind of distancing himself from this text. Because the writer writes in such a way that he's simply reporting facts. He doesn't offer any commentary on this, or any, any um, overt commentary anyway. It's not as if he said, this is what Micah did, and this was displeasing to the Lord. There's none of that. He just tells you what has happened. In fact, even the Lord himself seems to be distant from this. The only time you read the Lord's name, the only time you read of Yahweh, is when the people in the story are speaking of Yahweh. The writer doesn't tell us what Yahweh is actually thinking about everything that is unfolding here. And so if you feel like you want to distance yourself from this, you're in, good, you're in good hands. So let's briefly consider the story before we try to draw any lessons from it. The account opens, chapter 17, verse 1, in the hill country of Ephraim. Now this region, the hill country of Ephraim, plays a significant role in the book of Judges. Joshua was buried in the hill country of Ephraim, chapter 2, verse 9. Ehud sounded his trumpet in the hill country of Ephraim, chapter 3, verse 27. And Deborah held her court in the hill country of Ephraim, chapter 4, verse 5. Gideon called men from this region to join him in his battle against the Midianites in chapter 7, verse 24. The point is that this region has played an important role in some of God's most significant saving acts in the book of Judges. But now the same region is going to become a source of deep idolatry. The story introduces us to a man named Micah. <clears throat> Micah confesses to his mother that he had stolen the 1,100 pieces of silver that had gone missing from her house. Now, when she had discovered that the silver was missing, she immediately placed a solemn curse on this thief who would break into her house and steal these 1,100 pieces of silver. But now that she realizes that it was her own son who did it, she, she hurriedly turns this curse into a blessing instead. She dedicates the two, 200 of these pieces of silver to be used for the construction of a carved image. <clears throat> Sorry, something I'll throw it here. Of a carved image in honor of Yahweh. <clears throat> this image was placed in Micah's house, and he, he constructed a shrine and he built an array of, or he added an array of religious objects to, to aid in the worship of this, this idol that he had built. And he even ordained one of his priests as, or one of his sons as a priest. But then, before too long, another man comes into the picture. A young Levite comes into the picture. And when Micah realizes this man is a Levite, it's as if he forgets about his son. This, this Levite becomes the son that he never had. And his son's standing there saying, Dad, I'm right here. But he says, you know, you be to me a priest. And his son is forgotten. He appoints this Levite as a priest. He offers him generous financial compensation and free clothing and rent-free accommodation in exchange for priestly service. But about the same time, in chapter 18, the tribe of Dan is still looking for an inheritance in the land. They're there. They haven't taken any inheritance. And so the, the leaders of the tribe appoint five scouts in chapter 18, verse 2. <clears throat> So the people of Dan sent five able men. These are brave warriors, brave scouts who are going to go and search for some land to take. And so they, they head out looking for an inheritance. And they happen to pass through the hill country of Ephraim. And they're there, they need somewhere to, to rest. And so they open the Airbnb app on their phone and they find that Micah's house is available for, for accommodation. And so they, they secure this accommodation at Micah's house. And while they're there, they hear a voice that they recognize. And this voice happens to be the voice of this young Levite. 
And the Levite tells them about God's providence in his life, how God has led him to the house of Micah, and, and he has enabled him to become a priest to fulfill his Levitical duties, this wonderful providence of God leading Micah in idolatry. The scouts then ask him in chapter 18, verse 5, they said to him, inquire of God, please, that we may know whether the journey we go on or we, on which we are setting out will succeed. And the Levite doesn't, it doesn't actually tell us that the Levite inquired of God. The Levite simply says, the priest said to them, go in peace. The journey on which you go is under the eye of the Lord. So he doesn't actually ask God. He just says, yeah, you guys are on the right track. Go, God bless you. The scouts then move on from Micah's house. And they come to a perfect place to attack. These, these brave warriors find the weakest possible place that they can attack. A city by the name of Laish, unguarded, unsuspecting, unallied. And they return home to report to their tribal leaders that they found an inheritance to grasp. And so the tribal leaders arrange a small force to go and attack Laish. And this small force sets out the next day. And as they're coming through the hill country of, of Ephraim, the, the five scouts say, by the way, when we were here yesterday, there's an Airbnb here that um, has a, a priest in it. And it has some idols and it has a shrine here. And so they decide, okay, well, they're going to turn aside. They're going to go and they're going to steal these idols. They're going to persuade the priest that he would be better served by, by being a priest to an entire tribe rather than to one man. And they'll take these idols from Micah's house. And so they go and they do that. And Micah learns that these men have come and taken his idols. And so he gets a small army of his own and he goes after them and he confronts them about it. But he quickly realizes that him and his little group of friends are no match for this military army of the Danites. And so he just gives up and he turns around and he goes home. And the Danites take his idols with them and take his priest with them. And they go and they attack Laish and they, they defeat Laish. They rebuild the city. They rename the city Dan and they set up Micah's idols in the city of Dan and Micah's priest goes with them. And the, the text tells us at the end that this man and his descendants served as priests to the tribe of Dan until the time of the captivity of the land under, under the Assyrians and the Babylonians much later. So that's the basic story. <clears throat> that's the, the unfolding chronicle. And as I said, the writer tells it in such a way that he's simply reporting facts. He doesn't offer much overt commentary as he's telling the story. But the truth is, actually, as you read the story, and as you read between the lines... There actually is commentary. There's, there's unspoken commentary that the writer is, is offering here. So I want to talk a little bit about this unspoken commentary. Dale Ralph Davies suggests that the author's critique can be seen in at least three ways. Davies writes, quote, Our writer, then, is no impartial observer, but a hostile critic. He hints at this by the way he uses contrast, depicts characters, and maintains distance. So let's talk about each of these underlying critiques that he gives, these unspoken commentaries. First of all, consider the way that he, he employs contrast. It's clear that the writer intends the reader to observe contrast between God-honoring worship and idolatry. This is most clearly seen in the very last verse of this section, chapter 18, verse 31. Listen to 18, chapter 18, verse 31. So they, that's the, the Danites after they've defeated the city. So they set up Micah's carved image that he made as long as the house of God was at Shiloh. Now the significance about this is that Shiloh was also in the hill country of Ephraim. So this is kind of like saying that, that the Danites set up the shrine of Micah's God in Brackenhurst while the, the tabernacle was set up in Brackendowns. It was just down the road. But Micah is saying, or the Danites are saying, we're going to set up our own shrine here. Shiloh also is a significant um, place in the story of Joshua and Judges. When the Israelites had first secured territory in the Promised Land, Joshua immediately set up the tabernacle in Shiloh, Judges chapter 18, verse 1. And then it was in Shiloh, Judges chapter 18, verse 9 and 10, that Joshua actually divided the land as an inheritance. And so the, the tabernacle of, of God and the Ark of the Covenant were in the very same region where the Danites set up Micah's God. And you're supposed to read this and, and notice that there's a strong contrast here. You've got the house of idols and the house of the living God in the same place. 
But the writer also wants the readers to um, pick up on perhaps some more subtle hints. For example, you can't miss the contrast between biblically regulated worship and human creativity. This silver that is stolen, Micah's mother dedicates it to the Lord so that a carved image can be built in order to aid the worship of the Lord. And immediately you're reading this and you think, but what does the second commandment say? Doesn't the second commandment say, you shall have no graven images? This is human creativity that is being introduced here. The informed reader will also detect a contrast between God-honoring faith and empty superstition. What's Micah's hope here? We read that the last verse of chapter 17. Now I know the Lord will prosper me. Why? Because I have a Levite as priest. This is the attitude of the, the, the Israelites in the early chapters of 1 Samuel. Remember, the Israelites are going and they're at war with the Philistines and they're losing. And so what do they say? Go, fetch the Ark of the Covenant and bring it here that it may save us out of the hands of the Philistines. And what does God say? No, forget it. This wooden box that is covered in gold is not going to save you out of the hand of the Philistines. And so God actually allows the Ark to be taken because the people were placing their faith in that wooden box rather than in God. Well, Micah is here placing his faith in the fact, as long as I've got a Levite, then God will be pleased with me. He seems to have believed that God would be fooled by a mere veneer of orthodoxy. And the writer wants his readers to come away completely unimpressed. He wants his readers to be angered at the idolatry of Micah and the Danites. He wants his readers to long for someone to come and stop this. In those days, there was no king in Israel, but everyone did whatever was right in his own eyes. And you're supposed to be reading this and say, oh, that there was a king who would put an end to this. So we see the way that contrast is employed. Secondly, we see um, the, the writer's unspoken commentary, commentary in the way that characters are depicted. The characters here are almost comical. You've got Micah's mother who pronounces a solemn curse against this person who has stolen her money. But then she realizes, oh, it's her son. And suddenly, no, oh, blessed are you, my son. Micah, his name means he is like God. Micah is nothing like God. He gladly erects an idolatrous shrine in his own home. And then he tries to slap a veneer of orthodoxy onto his homemade religion by securing the services of a genuine Levite. And speaking of that Levite, how seriously can we take this young man who is willing to not only perpetuate idolatry, but is willing to sell his services to the highest bidder? Well, Mike is offering me this, I'll serve him. But hey, the Danites look like they got a sweeter deal for me, so I'll just go after them as well. And let's also not forget the, the brave and capable Dan, Danite warriors. These able men who can only find the weakest, most indefensible possible city to attack. That's, that's the best that they can do. We also see the commentary in the, the glaring short-sightedness of these characters. This tremendous rejoicing throughout this, this section in the providence of God. The characters all seem to assume that God's providence is a sure sign of God's blessing. I mean, how coincidental that a Levite would come just when Micah was looking for a priest. Isn't that the providence of God? Surely God must be pleased. He wouldn't have sent a Levite at just the right time if he didn't want me to appoint this Levite as my priest. How fortunate that the Danite scouts would encounter the same Levite just when they were looking for encouragement on whether their mission was going to succeed. And wasn't the easy victory at Laish a sure sign that God was with his idolatrous people? That God was supporting them? If God was against us, he wouldn't have allowed us to defeat Laish so easily. <clears throat> That's how the characters in the story seem to interpret providence. And the reader, again, should be shaking his head, saying, how blind are these people? Everything smacks here of satire. We cannot possibly take these characters seriously, and we're not meant to. The writer is portraying them in such a way that they do not stand as examples to be emulated. And so we see his commentary in the contrast that he employs, in the characters that he depicts, and then finally, very briefly, in the distance that he maintains. As I've said, he writes as if he wants nothing to do with this. He, he's keeping his distance from the, 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 the events that he's reporting here. He doesn't want to be tainted by the events that he records. He doesn't insert himself into the story and he wants his readers to feel the same way. 
So there we have the unfolding chronicle. Told, we've spoken about the story as it goes. We've spoken about the unspoken critique, the, the, the way that the, writer, the writer's unspoken commentary, the way that he's trying to help you to see his opinion of this. But then finally, let's talk about the unmistakable condemnation. This is the, the, the major teaching of the text. If we're asking, okay, we've spoken about the story, we've seen the, re- the writer's opinion of the story, what are we supposed to take away with this? If we consider the story before us and the writer's implicit critique of events and characters, what are we coming away with? Well, clearly, the writer is saying something to us about false worship. The major lesson here has to do with false religion. Idolatry was and is to have no place among the people of God. The teaching of this text all centers on this matter of false religion. And we see at least four warnings in this regard. The first of them will be the longest and the others will be a little bit more brief. Four warnings that we want to come away with as we consider the story, as we consider this text. The first of those warnings is, has to do with the folly of false religion. The folly of false religion. The writer wants us to dwell on the utter folly of this false worship. It should strike us as foolish that Micah and the Danites believed that their own form of worship was sufficient to please Yahweh. Now, I want you to notice here that the the false worship, the false religion that is envisaged here, it's not rank paganism. It's not like Micah is saying, okay, well, I'm going to abandon all allegiance to Yahweh and I'm going to serve Baal or I'm going to serve Ashtaroth, or I'm going to serve Marduk, or one of the many gods in the peoples around him. No, he he wants to worship Yahweh. He's trying to worship the true God, but he's worshiping him in the wrong way. The problem is God had specifically said how he was to be worshipped, but Micah is introducing his ideas into this. What we have here is a syncretistic form of worship. Syncretism, yeah, is seen when Micah and his mother introduce elements of idol worship, a graven image, religious artifacts, superstition, into the worship of Yahweh. Again, they're, they're trying to worship Yahweh. What does his mother say? I dedicate the silver to the Lord, to Yahweh, from the hand of my son to make a carved image and a metal image. The problem is they're blending their or they're blending paganism, these elements of paganism, with the worship of the true God. But that ends up being a worship that God rejects. Ed Stetzer says that syncretism, when you're trying to, to marry your opinion of how God should be worshipped and related to, with God's revelation of how he should be worshipped, he says that syncretism dilutes dependency on Christ, changes the gospel, creates a mixture of multiple gods, and thereby denies Christ his rightful place as the one and only Lord in the life of the believer. Those who would mix these practices, if not moving away from them, end up with a false, syncretistic gospel, not the gospel of Jesus Christ. Sorry, let me just get my water here. Was that Joel? Thanks, Joel. Now, we should... We should know what that's like in South Africa. In 2016, a community survey was done, which revealed that South Africa, wait for it, South Africa is 79.8% Christian. Isn't that wonderful? That means that there are 35.8 million Christians in South Africa. If that community survey is to be believed. But I don't think any biblically instructed Christian living in South Africa will for a moment buy those statistics. 35.8 million South Africans may profess faith in Jesus Christ, but the fruit of the Spirit does not match that profession. What's the problem? The problem is that in South Africa, as in most of Africa, Christianity has been so blended with other religions that it's really become another gospel. It's not biblical Christianity that is practiced. Ed Stetzer again says it well. He says, when anything is added to the message of the gospel, the uniqueness and sufficiency of Christ is compromised and another gospel is created that is not actually the gospel. That's far too common in South Africa. 
Religious syncretism breeds religious compromise. Micah and the Danites made all sorts of compromises because they tried to marry their religious expression to God-regulated worship. But they quickly found out that their expression of worship became more important than God's revelation of worship. And that always happens. Mark Rushdoony says, A syncretist believes in God when it suits him and will obey his word when it is useful, but in reality he serves himself and obeys his own self-will. That's what happens when we try to bring our own ideas of how God should be worshipped into God's revelation. Now we can easily cast aspersion on the religious syncretists out there. Those outside the building who are, who are marrying their ideas of how God should be worshipped to God's own revelation. But let's be honest, we battle with this temptation ourselves, don't we? God has clearly revealed how he is to be worshipped. God has clearly revealed the basis of our acceptance before him. But we're so frequently tempted to blend God's requirements with our own inventions. We do this by, form, by, by way of legalism. We're tempted to believe that God will be pleased with our own efforts. Micah believed that God would accept his worship if only he could get a few technicalities right. He just needed um, to have an ephod because God had instructed an ephod for worship. He needed a priest to be ordained because he couldn't approach God himself. And bonus points if that priest was a Levite. If he could just get those technicalities right, God would be sure to be pleased with him. He was putting into place forms of worship that he believed would secure divine favor. The problem was that he came to trust in those forms rather than in the God who had commanded many of those forms. Do you know the temptation? Do you know what it's like to trust in the things that God has commanded rather than in the God who has commanded them? Do you know what it's like to be confident that you are pleasing God because you read your Bible this morning? Because you prayed this morning? Because you gave your tithe to the church this month. Because you ministered to the needy. Is your confidence in life and death the fact that you were baptized? The fact that you're a member of a church? The the ritual of a parent's dedication, a child dedication in front of a church? Is that where your confidence lies? Now those are all good things and God has commanded many of them. God hasn't commanded parent dedications, but he's commanded baptism, he's commanded church membership, all those things. Those are good things, and they have their place in the Christian life. But if we trust in those things rather than trusting in Jesus Christ as the one mediator between God and men, we have bought into a syncretistic gospel. Your pledge, your your allegiance to Jesus Christ should absolutely produce acts of obedience. But those acts of obedience should be the result of, not the root of your allegiance to Christ. Another form of syncretism we see in this text is Micah's individualism. Again, you got the house of God, the the tabernacle of God, the God-authorized place of worship right there in the hill country of Ephraim, but it was too much of a schlep for Micah to go there. So I'll rather just set up worship in my own home. He had no need to go to the house of God. He could worship just as well in his home. All he needed was an image to focus on, some religious artifacts to guide him, and a priest to intercede him. And again, bonus point to that priest was a Levite. Again, do you know the temptation? We've, Doug has mentioned this many times in recent weeks. Right now, we're in unusual times. Right now, the bulk of our church is sitting at home in front of a TV, being guided in worship by an image on a screen with their own religious artifacts, perhaps a Bible or something on their lap. That kind of live-streamed worship is a temporary necessity. But the danger is that we become comfortable with this temporary necessity and grow complacent in our worship. Spending the Lord's Day in your living room, in front of your TV, is necessary right now, but it can't be forever. It's not normal, and we must guard our hearts from allowing it to become normal. As we're we're forced to sit at home and and not gather with the saints, we should sense that something is not right, that this is not corporate worship. This is not church when I'm sitting in my own living room. There should be a longing to gather once again with God's people for worship as God has ordained. Now, don't get me wrong, by the way. I'm not saying that there's anything sacrosanct about a building. We can do church. We can worship God as, as a church with or without a building. There's nothing in the Bible that commands a building with nice heaters, comfortable chairs, and an expensive audiovisual system. That can aid in the way that we worship, but that's not commanded. But the gathering of believers on the Lord's Day to worship together is. 
And Micah's shrine was no substitute for the tabernacle in Shiloh. And your living room is no substitute for the gathered people of God. But then we see a third form of syncretism in our text, what we might call this um, reflectionism. Here's the point. Israel was supposed to oppose the pagan culture around them. But instead, what is happening here is that Micah and the Danites begin reflecting the pagan culture around them. They start becoming very much like the pagan culture. See, if we're not careful, we can find ourselves reflecting our culture in our religion rather than opposing it. Isn't the rallying cry of the world today and some parts of the the so-called church, much of what was happening in the book of Judges, isn't the rallying cry is that everyone must be allowed to do whatever is right in his own eyes. And if we're not careful, we can buy into that in our worship and in our Christianity. But true worship opposes that. Christianity calls us to do what is right in God's eyes, not in our own eyes. You can see this in the ecumenical movement where it's not allowed differences to divide us. Don't worry so much about your view of Jesus Christ and your view of Jesus Christ. Let's just all come together, hold hands and sing Kumbaya. Whereas biblical Christianity says, no, your faith rises and falls on a proper understanding of who Jesus Christ is. The church growth movement reflects this. Sometimes it reflects worldly reasoning more than biblical Christianity. There's far too much emphasis on getting people in. Let's make the front door as wide as possible and grow our membership list as large as we can. And don't worry so much about expecting your people to live holy lives, to, to live lives that reflect faith in Jesus Christ. Just grow your membership list. Whereas biblical Christianity says, no, if you have people on your membership list who are not living lives worthy of Jesus Christ, then you put them out because the church needs to be guarded as a place of holiness. Reflectionism might show up when we're excited about the things of the world, but not the things of Christ. We get together as a church and we, we sing songs normally and we, we listen to a sermon and then we all go at the end of it and we start talking about sport. We start talking about technology or fashion or schooling. And someone looking in saying, how is this any different to any other social gathering? It just seems like the same thing because we're not excited about the things of Jesus Christ. Well, we're supposed to see the folly of false religion. The others will be much quicker now. The second thing that we want to take away here is the tragedy of false religion. The tragedy of false religion is that it doesn't stop at its source. This text opens with a man of the hill country of Ephraim whose name was Micah. This man constructs a shrine and he implements false worship in his own house. That's where it starts. One man in his house. Before long, a second person is invited into this. This Levite comes along. And by the end of the story, an entire tribe has been infected by this false worship. How utterly tragic. Now, of course, we say, yeah, okay, but, but, but that's them. That won't happen to us. We're much stronger than that. We have a faithful Christian legacy. We have good teaching. We're not going to fall prey to the same syncretistic idolatry that Micah and this Levite and the Danites fell prey to. Well, the writer wants to warn us against such prideful thinking. Because look with me at chapter 18, verse 30. Listen to this. And the people of Dan set up a carved image for themselves. And Jonathan, the son of Gershom, son of Moses, and his sons were priests to the tribe of the Danites until the day of the captivity of the land. The identity of this Levite has been kept silent the whole time. Now, right at the end of the story, we're told this Levite, who's leading people in false worship, was the grandson of Moses. The one who gave the law, his own grandson, is now leading in false worship. Now, by the way, depending on your Bible translation, you may have a slightly different translation. There's some Bible translations render that as the son of Manasseh. There's a technical explanation for that, um, but I'm persuaded that, that this is the correct translation. As this man was the son of Moses. The grandson of Moses is leading people in false worship. Even the faithful legacy of Moses was not sufficient to immunize Jonathan, the son of Gershom, against idolatry. Be careful of thinking that the faith of your parents, the faith of your grandparents, will automatically safeguard you against false worship. Syncretistic worship must be cut off at its source or is sure to spread like cancer. In fact, that's exactly what the second commandment says. Don't build any, um, don't make any images, any graven images. Why? 
because it says, You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. He's not saying there that if you worship false gods, God's going to punish your children for it. What he's saying is if you worship false gods, you're going to teach your children to worship false gods. And they're going to teach their children to worship false gods. This needs to be cut off at the source. It's absolutely tragic what happened here. Well, we've seen the folly of false religion. We've seen the tragedy of false religion. Consider the, the judgment on false religion. This is a bit of a technical point, but it's important. We're told in chapter 17, verse 3, um, he restored the 1,100 pieces of silver to his mother, and his mother said, I dedicate the silver to the Lord from my hand for my son. Notice this, to make a carved image and a metal image. So this, this idol that is being built is described by these two words, a carved image and a metal image. Now that's significant because in Deuteronomy chapter 17, um, is it right? No, sorry, Deuteronomy chapter 27, there is covenant blessings and covenant curses that are pronounced upon God's people for certain things. And listen to, listen to chapter 27 verse 15, Deuteronomy 27 verse 15. Cursed, okay, this is, a, this is a formal curse of God. Cursed be the man who makes a carved image or a cast metal image. The same words that are used to describe Micah's image. Deuteronomy says, if you build these things, you are cursed from God. And the reader is supposed to realize that as you read of Micah making these things, he's already been cursed of God. He's already fallen under the judgment of God because he's invited God's curse upon himself. We're meant to understand that the judgment of God had already fallen on him. Now that is important because that needs to be contrasted with the, the superstitious trust that the characters in the story have on the providence of God. They could easily have said, well, God is okay with my idolatry because everything seems to be going so well. We've found lost money, a Levite has come, we've defeated uh, a city and taken our inheritance. God's providence is smiling on us, he must be okay with us. But you go back to what the Bible says, and it says, Cursed are you if you make these idols, if you worship these idols. The author is again inserting silent commentary. Providence should not be understood to overrule direct commands of God. But don't we fall into the same trap sometimes? I know I'm not supposed to work seven days a week, but I am working seven days a week, and business is booming. God must be on my side. I know I'm not supposed to marry an unbeliever, but I've never been happier. God must be pleased with this. I know I made a lifelong commitment to him. I made a lifelong commitment to her, but I've never been so miserable, so surely God wants me to pursue a divorce. We're reading Providence when the commands of God say something, and we're saying, well, no, but Providence seems to be suggesting something else, and I'll go along with Providence. No, we need to go with what the commands of God tell us. When God has spoken, we dare not let our interpretation of providence override his clear commands, or we will fall under the judgment of God as Micah did here for disobeying the commands of God. So the, the folly of false religion, the tragedy of false religion, the judgment on false religion, and then finally, let's talk briefly about the cure of false religion. Our text wants to say something about the cure of false religion. That well-known verse in, verse in Judges. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. The writer is saying there's a solution to all of this. The solution is a king. Now, of course, it wasn't as simple as that because it wasn't too long before Israel did get a king. They got a king named Saul, and he seemed to do absolutely nothing to stem the flow of idolatry. But then another king came along, a king by the name of David. And David began reversing many of the, the idolatries that the people fell into. The point here is that not any kind of king will do, but if there's a king who knows God's law and there's a king who's interested in obeying God's law, things can be set right. Things can be reversed. David started to do that. But of course, even David couldn't permanently put an end to idolatry, could he? Because after David, a series of kings followed. Most of them led the people deeper into idolatry. A few of them opposed idolatry and tried to remove the high places and places of false worship. But even they died, and then the people went back into idolatry again. Even the influence of the godly kings had only a temporary effect. Another solution was needed. And where do we look for that solution? We look for that solution in the king of kings, the ultimate son of David, Jesus Christ. 
Jesus Christ came to fully and finally deal the death blow to idolatry. And he could do so because he wasn't just focused on external behavior. He was focused on the heart. He has the ability to change the heart. When we submit to him, he gives us a new heart that no longer pursues other gods. And yes, we still sin. And yes, we may still temporarily and periodically give our allegiance to other things. But with Jesus Christ, he can work in us a change of heart that causes us to increasingly abandon other allegiances as we pledge our allegiance to him. And here's the incredible thing. How did he do that? Micah fell under the divine curse of God because he built these idols. Jesus Christ delivered us from the curse of God by becoming a curse for us. He took upon himself the sin of the world, the sin of the people he died for. He took upon himself the penalty for our sins when he died on the cross. He became the curse of God for us, and God clearly displayed his acceptance of that sacrifice by raising him from the dead, and then 40 days later, seating him as the king of kings at his right hand, where today he rules from heaven so that there is no excuse for us to do what is right in our own eyes. And so Micah's story is a lesson in syncretistic religion. And before we're tempted to be too critical, we want to admit that we ourselves have a tendency to struggle with this. We have a tendency to want to synchronize our own ideas of how to worship God with his revelation of how we should worship him. We must avoid that temptation. Because to give in to the temptation to syncretism is to embrace idolatry and to fall under divine displeasure. And the solution to that, the solution to this false religion is to keep our eyes and our hearts fixed firmly on the King of Kings who will give us the ability to do what is right in his eyes rather than our own eyes. So may we look always to our King of Kings, and may we therefore live lives and offer worship that is pleasing to him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that once again events that were recorded And events that happened so many centuries ago speak so relevantly and powerfully to us today. Lord, we pray that as we read the events of these closing chapters of Judges, that we would be delivered from the temptation to think that was them, that will never happen to us. Help us to be honest. If if this could happen to the grandson of Moses, we can fall into the same trap. In our own lives, In our churches, we can fall into the trap of religious syncretism. Help us to avoid that. Help us to to instead keep our eyes fixed firmly on the King of Kings. And as we turn our eyes upon Jesus, as the song says, help the things of this world to become increasingly dim in the light of His glory and grace. Produce in us worship that is true and faithful of the true and living God. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.